God's good. Amen. I say that a lot, and I mean that a lot. I really do. I don't say it lightly. I mean the Lord is good. Even sometimes when we go through difficulty and hardship, and the uh, old devil tell you, well, God really don't care about you. But I promise, if he watches a sparrow, he watches you as well. And I'm grateful for that. All right, Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse number 22. The Bible said, And the scribes which came down from Jerusalem said, He hath Beelzebub, and by the prince of the devils casteth he out devils. And he called them unto him, and said unto them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom be divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And we can take a lot of modern day uh, advice from that. You know, the old devil's method is always to divide. And I could say that a kingdom or a nation or a home that is divided against itself, it cannot, Jesus said, stand. And if a house be divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan rise up against himself and be divided, he cannot stand but hath an end. No man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Verily I say unto you, all sins shall be forgiven unto the sons of men, and blasphemies wheresoever they shall blaspheme. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation, because they said he hath an unclean spirit. Now I want to call your attention to the last little phrase in verse number 29. Now just about three or four weeks ago, I talked at length about blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And here's a phrase that I want to call your attention to, and I know I don't normally do this, but I sort of want to pull this out and look at it. Uh, Jesus warned that uh, said, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And I want to speak to you on that thought, the danger of eternal damnation. Would you bow and pray with me for just a moment? Our Father, as we bow in your presence this day, I ask you, Lord Jesus, to help us. I don't know the hearts of all of these people that are here, but I know that you do. I pray for assistance by the Holy Spirit as I try to speak this morning, God, that you might speak to every heart, Lord. May they hear more than just my words or the words of a preacher, but I pray the Holy Spirit would speak to somebody's heart. I know, Lord, there are people here today that need to know you as their personal Lord and Savior. God, would you grant it that this would be the hour that they'd come to trust the Lord Jesus. Our Father, we beg you and we plead with you. Help us, touch us physically today, and then, Lord, I pray that you might just touch hearts in this place, and we shall give you all the glory and the honor because we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. The subject of eternal damnation certainly is not a pleasant one, and we shudder to think about anyone dying and going to hell. If you're a believer, uh, you know, we sometimes conform and adopt the standards of the world, but we ought never to look at somebody and say, go to hell. Uh, if we just understood for just a little bit this morning the implications of going to that place, I don't think that any of us would ever tell another person that. And it ought to make us shudder to think that people do go to hell, but they do. A few years ago, I had a mother who came by my office and with a five-year-old daughter in her hand and said, listen, said she has some questions and uh, she needs to ask the preacher these questions. And so she dropped her off. And that little five-year-old girl stood in my office and uh, this is what she said. She said, preacher, said, do people still go to hell? And, you know, sometimes we relegate that to the rich man in Luke chapter number 16. Uh, but do people still go to hell? And I said, yes, honey, I think according to what the Bible says that people still go to hell. Then she asked me this question, said Preacher Don, 
do you know of anybody who's gone to hell? Now there's a question for you to think about, isn't it? Uh, do you know of somebody? I know people who have died without faith in Christ, and uh, we know what that means. I, I, we understand that, don't we? We do. And I would be foolish to think that everybody that I conducted their funeral went to heaven. I do know this. The one sin that will send a person to hell is the sin of rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the sin of unbelief. And I thought about that when that little five-year-old closed the door and walked out. It is a reality that people die and go to hell. I don't ever get as a believer where I get used to saying that over and over again. Jesus spoke of heaven some 15 times, but of hell he spoke 45 times. Years ago, I was in the Philippines, and I was preaching, and every day I preached in a different church. And on this particular Sunday morning, we were invited to go and preach outside Manila. It was probably about an hour and a half drive outside Manila. And the guys came by, picked me up, and uh, I went to this little church. Now, our idea of church is a big building with a steeple on top. But over there, it was just basically a little lean-to. It was a shelter that was outside and a road ran by it. And of course, the whole time the singing and the preaching was going on, there were cars going up and down the highway. And I got up that Sunday morning and I preached a message about hell. And I was almost shocked that when I preached that the people of that poor country stood there and wept. And some of them wept out loud as I talked about hell. Oh, listen, I'm afraid that a lot of times it never really gets a hold of our heart. That that is a place where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if people still go to hell, they're going there by the hundreds, by the thousands. And the scripture talks about that hell hath enlarged itself as if to take more inhabitants. And people are going there every day and they're going there without God and without hope. The danger of eternal damnation. Now those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we talk about it often, but we sometimes get used to the fact that there is the danger of being eternally damned and separated from the Lord Jesus. Now in this text, I want to preach as simply as I possibly can. And I want to encourage the three key words that are found in this text. The first one is the word danger. The second one is the word eternal, and the third is the word damnation. First of all, let's look at this word danger. Uh, the Bible warns that they who would blaspheme the Holy Ghost is in danger. And that brings to my mind that there is a possibility of damnation. There is a possibility that people in my family could die and go to hell. There is a possibility that our somebody from our church or our community, somebody that we love, there is the possibility of it and therefore the danger of it. I would remind all of us that hell was created for the devil and his angels. It was never God's intention that any human being go there, but people do go to that place according to what our Lord said. Otherwise, this would be a waste of our Savior's word to talk about there is a danger that you need to be aware of, a clear and a present danger. So here is a warning of danger, a warning sign. Be careful, be cautious. Many dangers our parents warned us of. I remember one of them was a hot stove. My brother, when he was about four or five years old, uh, put his hands up against our neighbor, had one of those old kerosene, uh, kerosene heaters, that, one of the old type that sat out in the middle of the living room floor. And all of a sudden, my brother just ran forward, about four years old, and he put his hands on the front of that red hot stove. And I remember uh, my mother talking about the blisters and what come up on that little fellow's hand as a result of that. And so if there's anything hot, my mother would always say, you better steer clear. She wouldn't let you around the stove for fear that you might pull a ball or something over and get burned. If she was ironing clothes, she said, you better be careful. This iron is hot. I don't think that there's any other pain like that 
of being burned. Now that is a terrible, painful thing. And so we warn our kids of it. We warn them about crossing the streets. We are constantly warning them. One fellow said he was 14 years old before he learned that his name was not no. <laughs> and we're always doing that as parents. We warn our children about things that will hurt them. And here our Savior warns that there is a possibility of being eternally damned. How this ought to really grip our hearts. Many dangers our parents warned us of. When uh, I was a boy, I'll never forget, it was probably around 7 or 8 o'clock one night. We were eating supper, just had got finished with our supper. And the telephone rang, and it was from people from our church. Now, back in those days, they didn't have a Y tree that calls, but just some people in the church that called. And they requested prayer for a man who uh, was connected with our church. And uh, so my dad said, well, what happened? And, and this man was probably in his late 30s. And I said, well, said uh, one of the other folks in the church said they had a cat that went up a utility pole and got up on the utility pole and said, been up there for a while, and the kids was a crime because they couldn't get their cat down, and said, go to the neighbors. And they said to him, said, the cat's on the power pole, said, can you help us get it down? And so wanting to be a help and seeing those little kids cry, he said, sure, I'll help. So he gets him a ladder and puts it up against the telephone pole. And he walk, goes up the pole, and everything is going good and the cat seems like it's glad to be rescued. And so he gets the cat in his hand. But the natural response for that cat is he picked it up and began to come down with it. You know what the cat did? It reached out with its paw and caught hold of that high voltage wire. And you can imagine what happened immediately like that. That man was not only electrocuted, but he fell the height of that utility pole. And uh, they said they didn't know whether they would make it or not. And that man was paralyzed and in a wheelchair the rest of his life. Now, I said all that to say this. My dad warned me. He said, I don't care how many cats or what gets on a telephone pole. Don't you ever go up a telephone pole to get a cat. So there's a lot of things in there that happen, unexpected things, things that you just couldn't think about. You know, a lot of people go through life and they feel like, well, I'm secure. Everything's going all right. But you know what? When you have a warning, when somebody stands up and says, hey, there is danger in what you're about to do, you'd do well to take heed to that. And here is our Savior warning. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so there's a danger of eternal damnation i see in this also the compassion of the savior and here's one idea that a lot of people have especially in these days when people know so little about the bible i believe there's a lot of people that think god is just a big old mean god and he's sitting up in heaven and what he's doing is he's just waiting on you to mess up or to get out of line and that god is anxious to just cut you off and send you to that place but that is a wrong idea of who God is. The Lord Jesus thinks so much and loves us so much that he's willing to warn us of a potential danger of being eternally damned. And you know, a lot of times in this day and hour, uh, preachers are not willing to say much about it. They're not willing to talk about it. And that is a dereliction of their duty if they don't stand up and warn people that no matter how society thinks, there is a heaven and there is a hell that is as real as sitting in this auditorium this morning. really is. So don't blame the messenger. That is the message the Lord Jesus warned of it here in this particular passage. Now I want to ask you something. If you were to wake up in the wee hours of the morning, you looked out your front window and across the way your neighbor's house was in flames. And you knew that in that house was a, f a husband and a mother, a father, and in that house there were little children in that burning house. 
I want to tell you what you would do. Now, you wouldn't think twice about it. You would run to that neighbor's house, and you would begin to beat on the doors and the windows, and you would begin to cry out, you better get out, your house is on fire. And you'd do whatever it took to get them out of there. You would not cease till you got those little babies and that mother and dad out of that house. Well, I want to tell you something. Every one of us that are believers this morning, we've been delivered from a burning house. And that's why we're so passionate about telling people that there is an awful place that is called hell. I've often wondered what it would be like if somebody who had gone to hell could come back and go up and down the countryside. You're talking about a warning why people would think that they were absolutely crazy. I read about the man in the 16th chapter of Luke's gospel. He knew that he couldn't go, but he said, Father Abraham, he said, let Lazarus, that old leprous beggar that had sat at his gate for all those days, he would have uh, said, let Lazarus go back and warn my brothers. I've got five of them, and they don't know anything about God, and warn them lest they come to this awful place of torment oh listen there is a danger and Jesus warns about it and then notice this it's not just the danger of something that could hurt you temporarily but notice this there is the word eternal is in danger of eternal damnation now what does that do that explains the duration of this danger in Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10 the Bible said in the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. If there was hope for this punishment to end shortly, then there would be hope. But I want to say this, this is eternal in its consequences. Eternal, the duration of it is forever and ever. And that literally means that that will be worlds without end or ages without end is the duration of that. If you could go to the people that was in hell this morning and peep over into there and say, just hang on and hold on. In 10,000 years, there'll be an opportunity for you to escape those awful flames. There would be hope, but in hell there is none. It is an eternal punishment that Jesus talks about here. When I was a little boy, about six years old, I'll never forget this as long as I live. There was a preacher in our church, and uh, he got up to preach, and he tried to define what eternal means. It is forever and ever and ever. There is no end to it. And this is what he said. He said, if you had a steel ball the size of this earth, 25,000 miles in its circumference if there was a steel ball and it's out there in space and once a year there would be an eagle that would fly from some other place and fly through the universe and come and land on the surface of that steel ball the size of an earth come once a year to land on it when so many years had passed that that steel ball was worn away to nothing he said, eternity would just be beginning. I've never forgotten that. Five years old to now, I still remember that preacher talking about that. You say, how long is eternity? We cannot grasp it. You know, we think here that sometimes time goes slow. I know it goes slow when you're uh, waiting on turn 16 to get your license or to get a job. Well, I don't know if kids look forward to getting jobs anymore or not, but... <laughs> We did when I was growing up. I wanted to get me a job, make my own money. I thought, boy, when I get me a job, I'll have plenty of money. I'll be able to buy all those things mom and dad never would let me have. Seemed like it took a long time to get to the age of 16. And then I was kind of looking forward to getting 18. So those two years passed pretty quick. But I'm going to be honest with you. I went to sleep last night and I was 18. I woke up this morning and I was 62 years old. That's what it seems like, isn't it? Time flies, it gets by. And, and, you know, time is something that it's hard for us to measure and grasp and get a hold of. And you feel that too when you look in the mirror and you say, where has time gone? It seems so short. But I want to say that it's going to pale in eternity. It is forever and ever and ever and ever worlds without end. 
danger of eternal damnation. Your soul is something that you can't take a chance with. You can't gamble on that and you can't, you can't risk that. You say, well, nobody's ever told me and I, I really didn't know about that. But the thing of it is, now you know, you know that you're gambling with your eternal soul. And Jesus warns about it. Ages without end. Every person who has ever died without God is there today. That man that Jesus talked to his disciples about. The rich man that's there. He's still there today. And he's there without any hope whatsoever. And then notice our third word, if you will. The word damnation. Now, you know, uh, and I'm not just, uh, I'm just going to say it like it is. Damn is used in all the wrong ways today. People put God's name in front of that. And what they're doing is putting themselves in the place of the judge, and they're judging God. But I want to say this. God is ultimately the one who does damn. It's not me. It's not the church. It's not our religion. And I despise that word with a passion. Something that the Bible says, it's Jesus said this, it's not a bunch of Baptists talking here, it's not a bunch of Catholics, it's not a bunch of Presbyterians, this come from the lips of our Savior. And he says this, he talks about damnation, what, what is damnation? It means to be cut off from God. It means to be without hope, and it means to be without His mercy. It means to come short of His righteousness and His glory. And the damnation is to be totally separated from God. And when we think about that, how awful that be. I, I've thought about, you know, over the years, we give the invitation time. And I remember what it was like to sit in church as a little boy growing up and you know, I, I didn't know a lot of Bible verses and stuff. I knew my mother and daddy was good people, and they brought me up in church. And, and I knew that there was a God, and I knew there was a devil, and I knew there was a heaven and a hell. And my mother taught me from the time that I was little that Jesus loved me more than anything. And I understood all of that. But there was something about it. When I when it come down to invitation time, I, I, I was wanting to go forward and be saved, but... I was so bashful and so backward, I, I couldn't. I, I could not go forward in a group of people. But as a six-year-old child, I knelt by my bedside with my mother there to pray for me. And I asked the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and save me. Now, I don't understand uh, how God gives faith to a little child. But I knew if I ever went to heaven, I knew if I ever missed that place called hell, that Jesus is all the way. And as best I could, little old six-year-old boy, I just reached out and I said, Now, Lord, I believe what you said in your word. And I know Jesus loved me. He went to the cross to pay for my sins. It's not that God's in a hurry to cut me off, but God's urging me to come and to be saved because my time is so short. And I honestly felt like I was going to hell. And I guess a part of Holy Ghost conviction, I guess we realize that we deserve to go there. But God interposes his mercy. And boy, this thing of damnation is a terrible thing. It, 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 and this damnation is a future destination. Only two destinations when we, when we die. Hell is a temporary place that will turn into the lake of fire. If you say, well, hell is a temporary place, you say, well, it ain't forever then. No, no, hell is the holding cell. The lake of fire is that eternal prison to which those who do not believe on the Lord Jesus will be confined forever and ever, the Bible says. I believe that everybody that dies and goes to hell will have only one little reprieve. And that will be that when hell gives up the dead that are in them and men stand at the great white throne of judgment, the Bible says that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then they'll be thrown into a lake of fire. Can you imagine swimming in literal fire and torment? I cannot imagine what that would be like. But the worst thing of it is that in that place they're cut off from the mercy of God. And that's future. That is a future judgment that all people will stand before him who believe not on the Lord Jesus Christ. This 
uh, damnation is final as well. There's no reprieve. There's no escape. There's no second chances. There's no do-overs. There's no deals. There's no exceptions. Every one of us will give an account to God. It is a final damnation. And then what brings this damnation? First of all, it is a sin of unbelief. The Bible says in John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. That means present tense. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You know what you do with Christ now depends on your status. Some folks think that, well, you know, when I die, I'm going out to a judgment. God's going to weigh my good works and my bad works. And if my good works outweigh my bad, I'll go to heaven. Bible does not teach that. You make your choice here. You make it now. You're either saved or you're unsaved. You're already under the condemnation of God if you've not accepted Jesus Christ. And what happens is when you close your eyes in death, you're going to open them in the place that you're going that you've already chosen. If you have chosen to believe on the Lord Jesus, you'll go to heaven at the moment you close your eyes. But if you do not, the moment you close your eyes, you'll go to that awful place and it's called hell. What brings it? Unbelief. And then I think a rejection of the Holy Spirit in Mark chapter 3 and verse number 29. It talks about that. When the Holy Spirit convicts and deals with your heart, and if you turn Him away and reject Him and say no to Him, you're in danger of eternal damnation according to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ.